Our speaker tonight is, uh, it's, my, uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce, is Dr. Victoria Fromkin, who is Professor of Linguistics, Vice Chancellor, and Dean of the Graduate Programs at the University of California, Los Angeles. Dr. Fromkin is an outstanding figure in what has emerged as one of the pivotal subjects of the modern university. To study linguistics is not just to learn an extraordinary number of languages, which most good linguists, it seems to me, do with, with a really quite discouraging facility, um, but to be involved with studies that lead towards uh, neurology and medicine on, on the one hand, towards literature on the other, and between to much common ground with philosophy and with psychology. Language is pretty basic. And it is not surprising to find some of the best scholarship uh, in modern universities in linguistics. Dr. Fromkin is among the best of this whole remarkable crew. She has won many awards, not only for research, but also for teaching. She has lectured around the world, and she is, is the immediate past president of the Linguistic Society of America. She has written eight books including a phonology of several African languages, a widely used text in linguistics, which has been translated into Japanese and into uh, Dutch, a book on speech errors, <coughs> and a book on slips of the tongue. Uh, this is an interest of hers that leaves anyone who would introduce her feeling just a shade uh, <laughs> uncomfortable. <laughs> There are dozens of articles across a broad range of linguistics, including one with uh, a title that I think must be, be the title in all academic uh, articles, Tips of the Slung, <laughs> <laughs> or to Air is Human. <laughs> Essentially, her principal interests are African languages, slips of the tongue, and the linguistic pr problems associated with traumatic head injuries. Dr. Fromkin will be visiting the university uh, next week as a Cecil and Ida Green visiting uh, professor. She and her husband arrived in Vancouver this afternoon. Her talk to the institute tonight marks the beginning of a visit in which many uh, in the university to which many in the university community ha are, are eagerly looking forward. Dr. Fromkin, uh, the Vancouver Institute is the oldest and most uh, cherished uh, uh, of the university's public forums. We welcome you to it and to this university and invite you to speak tonight on the topic Brain, Mind, and Language. Dr. Fromkin. I think that will do. Um, mm, the lights are very bright. But I can't see anyway, and I have to use another pair of glasses. One of the nice things that has happened to me in my life is that I find that the same glasses that I had to get to play the piano also are just the perfect glasses to look at a podium and also at my computer. So it's a, it's a very good bargain uh, when my eyes get like this. Um, thank you very much, President. Um, Harris, yes. Uh, <laughs> one also has slips of the mind. <laughs> it is really a great honor to be here. Um, I'm very impressed. Uh, I've been looking at the list of speakers at the Vancouver Institute, and I sort of feel like, you know, what, is, what am I doing here? And I just thank you all for the honor, to, for inviting me, and uh, when your president said that number of honors, I really feel that this is one of the finest that I have received in my professional life, and thank you very, very much. So I hope I do not disappoint all of you here and in the other rooms. And uh, in one sense, I'm not worried about that because the topic that I'm going to be speaking on, I think, is a tremendously exciting one and is one that is of interest not only to the professional, to the academic, to the scientist, but clearly is one that is of interest to every human uh, being. Uh, 
it's almost as if there was a conspiracy between President Harris and myself uh, in his remarks that opened uh, this evening, since he um, spoke and presented what I consider one of the great misconceptions about linguists. And in fact, uh, I, that was the whole first paragraph, which I am about to read. You will see, we did not plan this. But um, I am really delighted that he talked about how impressed he was with how many languages linguists knew and how fast they could learn them. Um, in fact, it's really uh, one of the uh, nightmares that linguists have uh, is when they go to a party or a cocktail party or a dinner and they're introduced uh, for the first time to uh, uh, someone that um, uh, they've never met before and they're introduced. This is a linguist, uh, uh, Professor Franken or uh, Professor Gilbert or uh, any, you know, what, whoever it happens to be. And as that comes out of the introducer's mouth, we linguists sort of hold ourselves uh, and wait for the next question, which will be, oh, how wonderful, how many languages do you speak? <laughs> And then we sort of hem and we haw, and uh, when we can stop being too embarrassed, we sort of, many of us say, one I think. Uh, <laughs> but then we have to go on and explain that linguists do not speak lots of languages, or that is, that is not a necessary uh, criteria for being a linguist. Polyglots speak lots of languages. And linguists study human language, and at least we, they're pretty sure to speak one. Um, now, there are, of course, many linguists who speak many languages. And as I was saying to President Harris when we were talking before he introduced me, um, it might be that because they have a talent for speaking many languages, they went into linguistics. But it is not because they are linguists that they speak many languages. Uh, and in fact, uh, there are, but I do have very good friends who are linguists who speak languages like Potawatomi and Osa and Chui. In fact, I do speak Chui. I have to, I have to admit. Uh, it's the one language other than English that I was able to really speak quite well, but I've forgotten the whole vocabulary since I haven't been to Ghana for quite a while. But uh, they, there are, you know, linguists speak Chui or Tabata Labal or Quechua or all these marvelous languages that we find in the world. But there are many linguists who as I said, do speak their native language, but probably know more about computer um, and artificial languages like Pascal or Lisp or Fortran or Basic or C than they do about the kind of languages that probably many of you speak, like French and German, and maybe even some of you do speak Osa or one of those funny languages. Linguistics as a discipline has changed dramatically in the last 25 years. And I thought it might be of interest tonight, before I get into the meat of my topic, to speak a little bit about what linguists were like 25 years ago and what they're like today. 25 years ago, the typical linguist in America, and that includes Canada, had a background in, I mean, some of my uh, my colleagues in the United States don't always realize that. Um, but the typical linguist had a background in anthropology or in language areas like Slavic, French, Romance, Fino Ugric, or various languages like that. Many of them conducted field work in Africa or South America or on an Indian reservation. They could produce many strange contrasting sounds in the language being investigated, baffling those who would swear all the sounds were identical. And I can give you some of those later if you'd like. And they would go around writing down strings of very funny symbols on three by five cards filed in endless numbers of shoe boxes 
which they carried with them wherever they went. In fact, if ever you saw somebody on a train or a bus or a car or a, a plane carrying lots of, of what you thought was shoes, it was probably a linguist. <laughs> Other linguists at that time perhaps were studying the historical uh, aspects of language. They might be sitting, instead of being out in the bush, sitting in an office, tracing the history of one or two words, and even sometimes an entire language, or would compare one dialect with another or one language with another in the attempt to reconstruct the proto-language. Some linguists were like Henry Higgins or his prototype Henry Sweet, who in many ways is my academic grand uh, ancestor, and would study, go around listening to the sounds of different dialects and again writing down in funny symbols the way people talked. They didn't care what they said, but they did care how they sounded. But times have changed. Today, in fact, it is hard to describe a typical linguist. We work in many diverse areas, but the tie that binds us all is our attempt to understand the human ability to acquire and use language and to construct a formal scientific theory of language which is both descriptive and explanatory. We approach this awesome task in many ways. We analyze and write descriptive grammars of non-literate languages as the traditional linguists did of 25 years ago. And we still, some of us that is, work on the historical uh, changes that take place in all aspects of human languages. Some of us still work in phonetics laboratories, but instead of just using our very good phonetician's ears, our phonetics laboratories are filled with very expensive and very high-tech instrumentation to study the physiology and acoustics of speech. Others of us work in hospitals and aphasia wards, gathering data from patients with language disturbances. There are computational linguists developing speech understanding systems and natural language computer parsers and mathematical linguists interested in the formal mathematical properties of human language. There are psycholinguists concerned with linguistic processing models, that is, with our ability to produce and comprehend language, and sociolinguists who work on language in its social contexts. There are dialectologists and there are linguists working on artificial intelligence systems. And then there are also neurolinguists concerned with the biological bases of human language, the interface between brain, mind, and language, the topic of my talk today. Although the area of linguistics now called neurolinguistics is of recent origin, the issue is not. Three long-standing problems of science and philosophy concern the nature of the brain, the nature of human language, and the relationship between the two. This relationship has been assumed for over 2,000 years. Cuneiform tablets from Assyria and Babylon remark upon disorders of consciousness and knowledge that may ensue when a man's brain holds fire. The earliest medical records of Egyptian surgeons recorded on papyrus their observations of language loss, believing that the breath of an outside god or death had entered their patients' brains, who henceforth became silent in sadness. It's a shame we scientists do not speak such poetry today. Although Platonic and Aristotelian wisdom did not extend to a recognition that the brain was the seat of all cognition and knowledge, one of the Hippocratic treatises suggests this basic connection. Franz Joseph Gall's support for this view in the late 18th 
and early 19th centuries was first violently rejected. In fact, he was violently ejected. But he finally was brought back <clears throat> into the scientific community, having convinced them that the brain is the organ of the mind. A pervasive reason, then, for studying language has been the historic assumption that language is a mirror of the mind, or that speech is the only window through which the physiologist can view the cerebral life as was suggested by the physiologist Fournier in 1887. In more recent years, a reason parallel to the aim of studying language as a means to increase our understanding of the mind or brain <coughs> is that a study of the brain may provide insights into the nature of human language. The human brain seems to be uniquely suited for the acquisition and use of language. As noted by the late great neurologist Geschwind, and I quote, the nervous systems of all animals have a number of basic functions in common, most notably the control of movement and the analysis of sensation. What distinguishes the human brain, he states, is the variety of more specialized activities it is capable of learning. The preeminent example is language. Thus, it is hoped that further knowledge of the functional anatomy and neurology of the brain may provide new knowledge on the structure, acquisition, and use of human language. The quotation from Fournier refers to speech, since there has been a persistent, though incorrect, view which equates speech with language. Speech, that is, production and perception or comprehension, is behavior. The use or performance of those who know a spoken language. Language is the abstract mental cognitive system which permits one to speak and understand. Language also underlies the ability of a deaf person to sign and to visually perceive and understand the gestures of another signing person. To equate speech with language is to obscure what is the nature of the linguistic systems which form the bases for all spoken languages and for all the sign languages used by communities of deaf persons throughout the world. As long as researchers concern themselves only with spoken languages, there was no way to separate what is essential to the linguistic cognitive system from the constraints imposed productively and perceptually by the auditory vocal modality. That is, to discover what is the genetically, biologically determined linguistic ability of the human brain. We now know through the work of linguists conducting research on these sign languages that their basic similarities to spoken languages are greater than their differences that they are subject to the same constraints on their structures and relate forms and meanings by means of the same kinds of rules. This therefore suggests that the human brain is organically equipped for language in any modality and that the kinds of languages which can be acquired by children are not determined by the motor or perceptual systems, but by higher order brain mechanisms. If this is so, then one can seek and find language universals which pertain to all human languages. A view, incidentally, put forth by Roger Bacon in the 13th century when he wrote, and I quote, he that understands grammar in one language understands it in another as far as the essential properties of grammar are concerned. The fact that he can't speak nor comprehend another language 
is due to the accidental properties of grammar, unquote. While these accidental properties may prevent you from understanding a speaker of Zulu, or a speaker of Zulu from understanding a speaker of Salish, or a user of American Sign Language from understanding um, someone <clears throat> who is a signer of Chinese Sign Language, Bacon was correct in that the more we look at all human languages, the more they appear to be governed by the same universal properties, universal principles, if you will, thereby supporting the view that the human brain seems to be uniquely suited for the acquisition and use of any language the child is exposed to. Both sighted, hearing, and deaf children can learn sign language. The reason deaf children cannot learn spoken languages with ease is because the child receives no auditory input. It is not the language ability which is lacking, since deaf children have intact brains. It is therefore not surprising that deaf signers with damage to the left hemisphere of the brain show aphasia for sign language similar to the language breakdown in hearing aphasics. It has long been known that all parts of the brain are not equally capable of dealing with language. In 1861, Paul Broca presented a seminal paper at a conference in Paris putting forth his discovery that lesions or damage to the anterior part of the left hemisphere of the brain, now known, not surprisingly, as Broca's area, resulted in a loss of ability to speak, whereas lesions in similar parts of the right brain did not. But long before Broca, <clears throat> even if the role of the left side of the brain was not known, there was speculation on asymmetries of brain function and recognition of the relationship between, for example, the right hand and language. In one of the Psalms in the Bible, we find the statement, <clears throat> if I will forget thee, Jerusalem, let my right hand die, and let my tongue stick to the roof of my mouth. Now, of course, we know that motor control of the right part of the body, that is, uh, including the right hand, is maintained by the left side of the brain. We can therefore explain why the <coughs> writer of that, to that writer of the psalm, why <coughs> there is this relationship. What is equally interesting regarding the effects of left hemisphere damage on the sign languages of the deaf is that the language impairment of these patients contrasts markedly with their relatively intact capacities to pr process non-language visual spatial relationships, further enforcing the fact that the left hemisphere has an innate predisposition for language, not speech, or the physical ways in which language is expressed. The view that the human brain is uniquely suited for the acquisition and use of language has been reinforced by the many attempts to teach language to other primates. While these studies seem to show that chimps and gorillas have greater non-linguistic cognitive abilities than previously thought, their non-human brains appear unable to acquire even the vocabulary of signs, let alone the complexities of other parts of language equal to that of a three-year-old child. There are a number of empirical facts which support the notion that the human brain is pre-wired for language. <clears throat> May I have some water, please? A child, regardless of race, economic status, geographical location, climate, religion, size, can acquire any language to which she is exposed. She is being used in the generic sense to include he. <laughs> 
No language, spoken or signed, used in the community in which the child is born and raised is too difficult for the child to learn. No special talents or skills are needed. Highly intelligent children, even geniuses, do not acquire language earlier or more completely or more easily than do ch children on the lower scale of intelligence, however measured. In fact, children diagnosed at birth as mentally retarded acquire language in the same way as those with normal intelligence. I will give you some examples of that very shortly. The human brain as a language device is very robust. Not only can a child learn any of the thousands of languages which exist in the world, she does so without being overtly taught. No one teaches a child learning English or ASL, or Swedish, or Yoruba, the specific rules by which an infinite set of sentences never previously spoken or signed or heard can be produced and understood. Yet, by the age of three or four, a child has this ability. The unboundedness or infinitude of language is true of every natural language. There is no language spoken anywhere in the world learned by a child at her mother's knee that has a finite number of sentences. One can provide both formal mathematical proof for this fact as well as examples to show this to be the case. Thus, for example, if the string of words, Vancouver is a beautiful city, is a grammatical sentence in English, then so is Vancouver is a very beautiful city, or Vancouver is a very, very beautiful city, or Vancouver is a very, 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 very beautiful city. How many varies are too many? Seven, 22. That is a very interesting fact. <laughs> Similarly, one can say, the University of British Columbia is in Vancouver, which is a very beautiful city. Or the University of British Columbia, Columbia which is in Vancouver, <clears throat> which is a province in Canada, is a very beautiful city. Or I can go on and on. It is not possible in any human language to put a maximum length on any sentence and therefore, knowing a language includes knowing the rules by which one can add varies or relative clauses or join sentences. Now, someone might say, but that is really silly. After all, how many varies can you say? And how many times can you say, this is the house that Jack built, and this is the straw that ate the rat, and whatever. You know that thing that goes on and on and on. Obviously, we all are mortal. Some of us wish we weren't, but we are. And you cannot go on forever adding sentences and relativizing clauses. But in principle, you can. In principle, there is no longest sentence. And in principle, therefore, a, when you know a language, you can produce and understand an, inf uh, an um, inf infinite number of sentences. What stops you from doing this are what we would call performance factors. We have to breathe, we get tired, our audience leaves us, we die, etc. <laughs> but in order to do this, if it is true that in principle this is true, then we must have a set of rules, something which tells us that this can be done and something which tells us that even though the University of British Columbia is in Vancouver is a good sentence in English, Vancouver in is Columbia British of University the is not a sentence at all, even though the same words are in that string. You must know something to tell you that. A child must know something 
and nobody teach it, has taught you why that is so, and no one has taught the child. What we do is we construct, when we are acquiring a language, these rules. Linguists call these rules, which define what a language is, the grammar of the language. And this grammar must therefore contain some recursive element which makes this infinity of sentences possible. A very young child already has knowledge of this grammar, which has been acquired, but which no one has taught her. Another superficially simple rule in the grammar of English, which no one teaches a child learning English, is how to form the plural of words, like cow, bee, dog, head. One adds a Z sound at the end of the singular form. Perhaps some of you thought we add an S. We don't add an S, and the child knows that we say cows, bees, dogs, heads, not cows, bees, dogs, heads. We use the S as the letter in or the, our spelling and orthography to represent both the Z sound in those words as well as the S sound in the plural of words like cat, cats, tax, naps. The child knows that. The child's brain is equipped to permit her to construct these rules, to group the sounds which are followed by a plural Z, those which are followed by a plural S, and those which end the words box, match, judge, which require a short vowel followed by an, a, a Z to form boxes, matches, judges. When children make mistakes on these plurals, for example, say mouses instead of mice and childs instead of children, the rule construction process is clearly revealed since the children cannot be simply imitating what they hear. Children produce such errors even if they receive only the correct or standard forms as input. This must mean that the child has constructed the rule. In fact, most parents don't know that rule and couldn't teach the child when to add an S and when to add a Z and when to add an Z, even if the parent wished to. In fact, we have to go through this whole thing in Linguistics 1, trying to explain now this is a class of sounds. When it ends a word, you add a Z, when it, et cetera. But you know it. Intuitively, you know it unconsciously, it's tacit knowledge, it's part of your internalized mental grammar. Similarly, no one teaches the child the rules which tell her that the following sentences have multiple meanings that are ambiguous. I think maybe if we look at them, it will, if I can find them, <clears throat> ah yes. but I can't find them. Oh, well, here they are. Uh, am I supposed to uh, turn some lights? Can Wait, it's not quite clear. I don't know. I can say them, even if you can't see them. Anyway, in the sentence, Ronnie wanted the presidency more than Nancy. Uh, it is clearly has two meanings. And children know that. You know that. But <clears throat> somehow, if I said, Ronnie wanted the apple more than the pear, it doesn't have two meanings. How do you know that? Because you know the grammar of English. Or, Mr. Magoo made his wife turn on the barbecue spit. That's a very nice, good sentence in English. I'm sure you know that it has more than one meaning. And one of, the, one of the sentences which I give as an assignment to my freshmen in the class is this third sentence. The police were ordered to stop drinking after midnight. 
I want you to know that that sentence has many more than just two meanings, and I'm not going to tell you what they are because that's your assignment for tonight. <laughs> Furthermore, a child hearing the sentences, John promised Bill to go, and John told Bill to go, knows that in the first one, it is John who would be going, whereas in the second, Bill would be the one to go if he did what he was told. No theory of learning by imitation or reinforcement can account for the child's learning the rules to account for this. The child at a very young age appears to have the ability to construct the rules of the grammar in addition to learning the forms and meanings of words, since the meaning of such sentences depends on more than the meaning of the words. This ability is not simply due to a knowledge of serial order. Such knowledge of serial order constraints might explain how we know that in sentence six, Arthur loved Guinevere, it was Arthur who did the loving, whereas in the sentence Guinevere loved Lancelot, it was Guinevere. Simple knowledge of serial order, however, cannot account for the fact that in the sentence, it is Guinevere who was loved by Arthur, Guinevere was not the loving one. I think we can turn that off now. The brain is equipped to deal with serial order, and it appears to be the left cerebral cortex that is responsible for this ability. But this in itself cannot account for the kind of knowledge required to acquire and process the complex syntactic rules which are used to decode sentences such as those <clears throat> that we have looked at, nor the infinite set of sentences our knowledge permits us to produce and understand. The brain appears to be specifically equipped for this task rather than for abilities which language may share with other cognitive systems. May I just ask, what time am I supposed to finish? <laughs> oh, wonderful. Thank you. That's lovely. Um, I won't need the whole half hour. We'll have enough time for questions. Further evidence illustrating the particular language learning characteristics of the brain is provided by the more or less universal stages of language acquisition. <clears throat> Work on formal theories of grammar has in the past 25 years brought us closer to an understanding of the nature of linguistic universals. Principles common to all languages as a result of the human biological endowment. Despite the fact that the rule to form passives, such as the ball was thrown by John, or questions like who threw the ball, or who is the ball thrown by, and imperatives throw the ball, differ markedly from language to language. Modern data and theory suggests such constructions are manifestations of simple but highly abstract underlying principles, which differ only slightly across languages. Work on languages related to English, like Dutch, French, Spanish, and Italian, and non-related languages, like Japanese, Chinese, Arabic, Hausa, Walpiri, support this view. Data on a wide variety of languages, as well as observations about how languages are acquired, permit the testing of various proposed formal and algorithmic models of the learning process. In particular, the acquisition data help resolve controversies regarding the species specificity and task specificity of language the language-specific innate constraints, and the relative contribution of the child and the environment to the learning process. One explanation for this mysterious ability to acquire language is that we are indeed genetically equipped to do so. 
just as birds are equipped to acquire the songs of their species. The ultimate goal in this ongoing research is a precise specification of what is a possible human language, which specifications are genetically pre-wired and biologically based. These pre-wired language learning abilities of the human brain appear to be independent of other cerebral activity, abilities. This is not to deny that when we use our knowledge of language and speaking and understanding, we also depend on non-linguistic systems and general knowledge of the world. But language can be learned independent of other cognitive systems. Thus, for example, children who have no difficulty in learning to speak and understand may have serious developmental dyslexia preventing them from learning to read and write or learning simple rules of arithmetic. The same child who knows that in the sentence, John showed the baby picture, <clears throat> John did not necessarily show a baby anything, whereas in the sentence, John showed the baby the picture, he did, may be unable to learn that if x equals 2y, then y equals 1 half x. Yet, it may well be that this algebraic rule is simpler than the syntactic rules which are used to decode the two sentences I just read. There are a number of case studies of children and adults severely mentally retarded from birth who display complex linguistic ability, but are unable to learn other cognitive systems. Marta, one young woman described by Jenny Yamada in a book which I hope will be available soon, produces utterances like the following. She does paintings, this really good friend of the kids who I went to school with last year and really loved. Pretty good sentence, huh? Or, last year at school, when I first went there, three tickets were gave out by a police last year. These utterances were spoken by someone who cannot add two plus two. Marta is not quite sure of when last year is, or how many tickets were gave out, and does not know whether three is larger or smaller than two but the structure of her sentences reveal a sophistication in syntax far greater than one would expect from someone with her deficient general cognitive knowledge. Thus, the human brain appears to be organized in a modular fashion with specific cognitive systems which can be acquired and disturbed independently of each other. We have come a long way in the last number of decades in understanding the brain. And similarly, we have come a long way in understanding the structure of human language. Of course, we are still far from reaching our goals. This is hardly surprising given the complexities of both phenomena. Linguists are increasingly interested in the converging evidence that focal damage to the left cerebral hemisphere does not lead to an across-the-board reduction in language ability, and that lesions in different locations in the left hemisphere are selective in the language disorders that result. The research on brain damage reveals a remarkable consistency in how focal lesions affect language or language processing. It is, however, an empirical question as to whether the parts of the language system which are impaired parallel the separate components of grammars posited by linguistic theory. If this is shown to be the case, such findings are important as further support for theories of language and as a first step in bridging the gap between brain and linguistic mechanisms. Linguistic knowledge, like all knowledge, is represented in the mind and brain. Linguists are concerned with the nature of this representation, including answers to questions such as, how is the grammar organized? 
What features of the grammar are universal and relate to all human languages? What are the basic units of language and the basic components of the grammar? Are these independent of each other? Or, for example, syntactic rules of sentence formation independent of rules of semantics which provide the meanings of these sentences? Since Broca, there has accumulated through studies of aphasia and by means of new technologies and experimental methods, increasing evidence to support models and theories of grammar developed by linguists on the basis of their studies of languages themselves, which argue that knowledge of a language is represented by an autonomous, formal, mental grammar finite in size and capable of generating an infinite set of sentences. This grammar consists of various components, the phonology or sound system, the syntax or rules for sentence formation, the morphology or how we put words together, the vocabulary or lexicon, and those aspects of meaning determined by syntactic configuration. These components form a structural system whose primitive terms are not artifacts of a system that encompasses both human language and other human facilities or abilities. The differential and selective breakdown of different parts of language as seen in aphasia studies, as well as data which show, for example, differential recruitment of localized brain areas depending on the kinds of linguistic input or tasks provide independent evidence for the autonomy of the components in linguist grammars. The dramatic new technology of neuroimaging techniques, such as computerized axial tomography, magnetic resonance, is removed very early because of tumor or various problems. Is that? Or even at later. Well, the, 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 if you're talking about the children with the removal, we do know, we, it was thought, and in fact, part of a very, very important and seminal work by Eric Lenneberg on the biological basis of language, where he put forth a very important hypothesis regarding the critical age for language acquisition, and did, uh, just as other, other species have different uh, uh, critical ages for the acquisition and, uh, of, the, of different um, behavioral abilities. And he did uh, relate this to the lateralization as well as stated that that period ended at puberty. Actually, uh, Steve Krashen showed that even from the data that Lenneberg used, that, uh, that was five years old and not a puberty. But even in the cases of children, uh, it, it was suggested that, well, if, a if the left hemisphere is removed, then the right hemisphere takes over. Uh, children seem to have the same language and, and ability. Uh, a number of very important studies by um, Dennis and Whitaker, Marine Dennis, have gone into uh, some of this, uh, have conducted research of much more sophisticated linguistic uh, nature. And they have found interesting differences in these children in their ability to process complex syntax. Uh, yes? Oh, no, there was much more than that. There is negative passive, there's certain relativization and other things. Yeah, we don't want to spend too much. Anyway, there are, I must say, one of my students right now is working with seven uh, uh, children who had early lesions or unfortunately uh, uh, gunshot wounds at a very early age, both left hemisphere and right hemisphere, and she is studying this and we will have further evidence. But there are at least five different studies that are going on now, some of which have been able to replicate uh, Dennis's um, uh, work. Uh, there are some critiques of it, particularly by Dorothy Bishop in regards to statistics used, but this is an open question. I think it's an interesting one. Yes?
Very good. Uh, the question deals with uh, language change and how fast does it change. First of all, we know that all languages change. Uh, it's, um, they, by the year 2004, whatever you said, it would probably not be very much change. But over hundreds of years, uh, languages do change. I and mean, I come up here, I mean, we, English, for example, you can go, you see even different changes in regards to different dialects of English. Uh, you have certain vowels in Canada, which I don't have, and at one time you didn't have, I mean, English didn't have those. Uh, there are, I mean, that's a fascinating question. I'd love to talk about all the ways languages change. Uh, actually, we, they continue to change, but our ability to speak to each other uh, continues more than it did before. When one group of people used to go out, you know, over the mountain, uh, to find better uh, hunting grounds and they were they never saw each other and then the languages changed then they never could understand each other they never spoke to each other uh, let's say a thousand years after the change took place uh, now with television and radio and, and airplanes I mean we keep in communication much more so that even where languages change we adapt more than we do but that doesn't mean the language doesn't change it's just that some the changes are often picked up more uh, in one area even if, if they take place. Um, and uh, if, if you want me to tell you, if you want to know why languages change, we don't know. Uh, we know certain things. I mean, I can give you some very superficial uh, certain aspects. I mean, we're always adding new words. I mean, you know, uh, uh, pet scan. I mean, who ever heard of pet scan before there were pet? Well, before we had washing machines, we didn't have, we'd have the word wash, uh, compound washing machine. But we, languages are wonderful. You can always add new words and make up new words. And uh, I mean, you know, blick isn't a word now, but it could be a word. I mean, there are all kinds of things like that. Um, that's simple, but why syntax changes, why uh, we uh, one time uh, used in English double negatives were the norm, and uh, rather now if you had a teacher like I did saying, you know, uh, two negatives make a positive, that's ridiculous, uh, because in Russian there are two negatives, in French there are two, and in Old English there was two negatives. Uh, but so languages change, and we have some ideas about sound change, there are a lot of of conflicting debates on uh, uh, why languages change the way they do. We don't really know the answer, but it's a very interesting question. Oh, oh, excuse me. Goodbye. I want to thank all of you for sitting through all this. I, I'm just really very, very moved by the number. I, ho I hope that you find language as interesting as I do. Uh, then you won't have wasted your time. Questions? Yes. Right. No. Uh, at least I don't think so. Uh, actually, there was a period, and that's, that's a fascinating question. Uh, the very famous uh, uh, Soviet, uh, Russian and then Soviet psychologist named Vygotsky, who wrote a very important little book called Language and Thought, had some very interesting ideas about the fact that first language and thought are one and then they split apart. Other people have raised these questions. But now we really do know that that is not so. We know, for example, that, um, uh, well, you take split brain patients. Uh, where the, the, the little pathway between the two parts of the brain called the corpus callosum uh, is split for reasons of very severe epilepsy and certain things so that you can provide input either to the left or the right brain and they, don't, you know, they don't, can't talk to each other anymore. Well, we know, for example, and I, some of the cases uh, in um, uh, uh, Sperry, who won the Nobel Prize, for this work in his laboratory in Caltech. A uh, patient, for example, if you if giving, uh, um, smelling an onion in the left, um, uh, the left nostril will be, uh, will be able to pick it out but will not be able to tell you 
uh, that it's an onion because there's no uh, uh, signal over to the left brain, which is, was the language brain. So that certainly if you can say that the ability to take the smell and translate it into a meaningful object and select the right object, I mean, that to me is thought. Uh, but there are a lot of other examples. Aphasia is a very good, uh, you know, aphasia cases where you have language breakdown, but thought continues. Or we have a lot, there's a very interesting case that uh, in Georgia, on a small rural area in Georgia, uh, uh, was, there was a, uh, was found by finally in the state a um, crew of, of um, ear testing, and people to test hearing went around into these little areas. And in one little community they found, oh by this time, I guess he was about 27 years old, um, a man who did not speak, who the whole area, the, all the, the neighbors all felt that he was mentally retarded. Uh, and uh, he was very, I mean, he got great loving care. His father was the minister, a black minister in the community. And he was a carpenter. He did all kinds of things. He cooked, he did, but he, never, he didn't have any language. But nobody could say, they all thought he was retarded until they found out in this, this investigation that he didn't have any hearing. And that's why he never learned to speak. And so actually, uh, he began, they began to, to teach him uh, sign language, but this was past the critical period. I haven't really heard as to how much language he did get, but probably he got some, but I'm not sure how much. But I think he certainly, I mean, there are lots and lots of examples as well as, as uh, various kinds of, of brain injury. Let me give you one other example. Um, language and thought. I mean, there are some cases of, with brain damage, for example, co um, of people who um, cannot, uh, oh, this is, I, I met one of these patients, it was very sad when I was in, doing work in, in Oxford, a patient who a lot, uh, uh, was unable to identify faces. Um, and as soon as, I mean, his wife walked in the room, he did not know who it was until she started to speak and he could still recognize her voice. So he had voice recognition, but he did not have uh, facial uh, recognition. There are others who completely lose the ability to comprehend or understand uh, real objects. Uh, someone will walk in the room and not know, will tell you, we say, what's a bed? Oh, you know what a bed is, a piece of furniture, you sleep in it, and you walk into a room with him, he doesn't know, when he sees the bed, he doesn't know it's a bed. And it is very serious because in order for him to go to sleep at night, you've got to put him in and say, this is a bed, and you've got to help him into the bed. Um, so, you know, but the, the question of he knows what a bed is, and once you tell him, he knows what to do. And there's lots of other uh, uh, evidence which I could give you. More questions? Yes. Yes, I think they're very interesting, and I think that mo in the, oh, I'm sorry, the question is, what do I think of the studies in Japan which show that there is different processing between uh, the, the Japanese um, orthography or writing system has two different kinds of character. One, uh, characters, one uh, set of the characters are based on the phonological Sim similar to the Roman alphabet, and you can, you know, there's a symbol for sound. Another group of characters are borrowed from the Chinese, which are primarily meaningful semantic symbols and do not represent the sounds but represent the meanings. And there has been found different kind, uh, well, different breakdown, if you will, even, in, and also through dichotic listening. Uh, it is suggested that, and, and tachistoscop, mainly tachistoscopic uh, tests where you can shine um, uh, an image into either the right visual um, uh, field or the left visual field, and therefore you know which part of the brain you're going to. And it was found that, for example, right brain uh, can do more processing of the characters which are symbolic and not representing meaning and perhaps are much more like symbols. The full extent of that we don't really know because we do have many examples of dyslexics in Japanese who then fail to, to you know, use both. 
but they're probably, just as we know that the right hemisphere does have some dictionary, it might be a different kind. And just as in the uh, kanji and katagana uh, differences, we might find in the right hemisphere just very simple dictionary entries of form and meaning, but without all the other syntactic representations and features which we find in the linguistic dictionary, which is in the left hemisphere. But I think they're very interesting studies, and we certainly have to continue looking much more at languages like this with writing systems of this kind. Yes. Quick question. With regard to Martha and her idea of free ticket Yes. Ah. Was she speaking in a impreciseness, or was she speaking only of a very vague concept? And if the latter, is it true to say that the word three is in her vocabulary? Ah, what I'm saying, the word three, but the meaning of it is not. She, the question was about, I'm sorry, I should remember, I apologize. Um, the, the question dealt with the case of Marta that I talked about and asked whether the, um, the fact that she did not really seem to know the meaning of three is similar to when some of us who get mixed up between what infer and imply mean, right? So we talk about implications when we mean inference. Um, and whether the question was whether this was really just vague knowledge and can we say that she knew the word three? Well, I think that uh, you can't say that she knew all things about the word three, because really normal knowing is clearly knowing both the sounds and the, uh, you know, whether it's a noun or a verb and whether it's uh, all kinds of semantic features, et cetera, and also certain uh, way when you use it and when you don't. What is interesting about Marta is that where, the, where she has world knowledge, she is able to uh, use that where, uh, knowledge and have language expression of it. Where she doesn't have world knowledge or any you know, other co uh, cognitive knowledge, you see it as a lack in her language. Now she has no, she knows the concept, overall abstract concept number, just as she does time. But she cannot figure out which, you know, she can't do anything with numerical concepts, and she can't do anything with time. So when she says last year, it could have been an hour ago. But she always uses time when she should use time, but she just doesn't know whether a week is more than a month is more. It's very interesting in that regard. So when you ask, does she really know the word three? Not in our sense. She just knows it's a number, but she doesn't know the detailed kind of meaning to it that we all know when we know the word three and that it's larger than two. Thank you. Yes, I must get back. Goodbye. Light. Ah, uh, I can't. See, yes, I see a hand. Yes, please. Um, you mentioned that the linguist has discovered some basic rules that are common between languages. Could you, could you tell us a couple of the kinds of rules that are common between all languages? The question was that I had mentioned that linguists have discovered rules that are common between or among languages or universals of grammar, and can I give you some of the rules? I would rather not try to be that formal and specific. There are some extremely interesting kind of, well, one thing, let, let me give you an example. One thing we know about all, that there are 
not the same rules, but similar rules. There is no language in the world, for example, I'm going to give you some sort of very uh, not terribly exciting examples, because otherwise I'd need a board and have to do a lot of parsing and trees and things like that. But one thing we know, a very simple rule that you could learn easily enough is that to do, let's say, to form a question from a declarative statement, reverse all the words in the sentence. So that instead of, uh, uh, my name is Vicky, uh, Vicky is my, or what did I say, my name is Vicky, Vicky is named my, I mean, that could be, that could be a rule. Very easy, right? But not a single language anywhere in the world has such a rule. Uh, similarly, we know that every language, let's take just spoken languages, have units of sound which some linguists call segments called phonemes. Now phoneme, oh, I'll do my trick. I love to do my trick. Just a moment. I have to, I have to rip a piece of paper to do it. Um, I, I love to do this trick because a, a, a great uh, neurosurgeon named Joe Bogan, who was the first, um, who was a surgeon to split the first brain, so in his, He's very important. He sat in for a whole semester in my freshman linguistics class, and he goes around telling everyone now that he really knows all about universals of language and particularly about wonderful things called phonemes. He says, I'll show you. And he does this trick because he learned it from me. He says, you see, and he, he describes it. He says, you know, we all think that we only have one P sound in English, right? Everybody knows that pit is, starts with a P, and spit has a P, and top has a P, and tip has a P. He says, no, I learned, I went to a linguistics class. We have more than one P in English. And for example, when I say pit, 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 can you all see pit, pit, pit? Uh, how, the, how there's a puff of air, but when I say spit, 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 Nothing happens. <laughs> so he said, and that's what means that here you have two sounds, but they don't change meaning, so they, all, they belong to one phoneme. Now, we find that true in all languages. For example, there are some languages which if I, well, uh, we, have, we make, if I said uh, to you, uh, my mother, uh, is going uh, to, you know, to the store, you'd say, well, what's the matter if she's got something in her nose? But in Thai, the difference between ma and ma uh, and na and na are, are they mean different things. So that we know that every language uses a finite set, an inventory of different sounds to contrast meanings. And sometimes they, even though there are different sounds, because we have a grammar of them, we do not uh, we don't even hear the difference. Like, we don't really hear the difference between pit and spit, even though those are two different P sounds. And in a language, incidentally, in Thai, the difference between pit and pit uh, are different, and they mean different things. Uh, similarly, uh, tone languages, for example, uh, uh, every language we know uses pitch to do different things. Now, there's some languages like English where if um, uh, one says, uh, uh, Mary is going home, uh, we know that it doesn't, it's not asking a question like, Mary is going home, or we know that if you, if you say she has a red coat in her closet, it doesn't mean the same thing as she has a red coat in her closet. Uh, there are various, we use pitch in that way, but some languages, it makes a difference if you say ma, 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 uh, and the very tone, or for example, in my language, tree, uh, if I say mifi kumasi, it means something different from mifi kumasi. Um, you probably can't even hear it, but one thing means I was born in kumasi, and another means I came from kumasi. And there's two different pitches. Uh, all languages use sounds to contrast meaning in this way. That's a very simple kind of a universal that we have found. Uh, yet, no language just reverses every sound in a word to change the meaning. So there's a constraint on what we can find in language. And those are very oversimplistic, but you really don't want to hear a whole uh, new lecture on formal aspects of syntax and language, I'm sure. <laughs> yes, yes. 
genie. I know. Yes. Yes. Well, I didn't teach her anything because I'm not a language. Yes. The question was, and I knew this was coming, and I'm terrible. I'm really becoming, I have no memory lately. Uh, <laughs> the question asked, said that, uh, that uh, I had referred to a case that I had worked with, who was in the literature is known as Jeannie, uh, and that she was um, isolated from the world. It's a very sad, tragic case. She was isolated from the world uh, up until she was third. She was discovered when she was 13 years, uh, 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 seven months. Uh, and uh, I mean, there are a lot of such closet cases that have been discovered, attic cases, children isolated, uh, modern day wild children, et cetera. Unfortunately, Jeannie was older than any other such case that had ever been discovered. And I was brought in uh, to, as a linguistic consultant, and then I and uh, now my colleague, Susie Curtis, who worked with, with uh, uh, Jeannie for, Susie worked, well, I worked with her, but Susie did the really definitive, uh, Curtis did the definitive work with her over five years. We were interested in testing that, uh, I guess I answered one of the questions in the other room, I guess you heard it, uh, someplace or something, about the critical age for language acquisition. And we were very interested as to whether Jeannie, at the age of 14, she was already pubescent, uh, she had no language. She had, in fact, been beaten if she made any sounds at all. She had no uh, auditory input. I mean, it was a really, really terrible case. Uh, the incredible thing to me, incidentally, is that she survived, which somehow shows the robustness and, of the human spirit, which is beyond sometimes belief. Uh, and she was also wonderful. I, and I was, you know, she was, she was a very seductive young lady. Uh, especially with men. <clears throat> uh, she used to follow my husband around and keep saying, I like Vicky's man. So she learned some language. Um, but one of the things we did find is that, uh, and some interesting studies that we did, uh, was that for the most part she was not using her left hemisphere. It was almost as if it had atrophied. Uh, and it's possible, I mean, we can do lots of conjecturing, but it's possible that she did not have the input to actually uh, start or trigger the mechanisms of, of uh, left hemisphere processing. Uh, but she did learn a certain amount of language. She certainly had a tremendous vocabulary. I mean, that again shows the div that language is not just lists of words. Uh, that's simple. I mean, you know, and, and uh, you know, chimps can learn 300 words. Well, Jeannie, you know, in like uh, a month had learned 50, and then by a year we couldn't count them anymore. But the use of the complex syntax was very deficient. Her use of what we call morphology or the way, you know, the suffixes and, and inflections of, of sentence, of words and, and syntax was very deficient. And uh, I know somebody's going to ask me what's happened to her and how is she now, and I can't tell you that. That's another whole long story, but unfortunately, uh, her mother uh, assumed, was given the guardianship back, and she uh, didn't want anybody to have anything to do with her after that. And so we have not really been able to see her. But by the, after the six, or actually I, I knew her for seven years, she did learn more than we expected her to despite all the psychological problems, the physical problems, the malnutrition, the fact that she could hardly walk when we, she first was discovered she couldn't even swallow because she had been fed by just stuffing baby food down her throat and, and, you know, and she sort of let it drip down. I mean, and yet she learned some language. I mean, to me that again shows the robustness of our language ability, but uh, also shows that you probably have to learn it without all these other terrible problems and possibly within a certain earlier period of time. Yes. Dr. Pompkin, is it possible for a normal child to learn several languages simultaneously? Or is there a Thank you for asking that. The question uh, at was um, asked whether it's possible for a normal child to learn several languages simultaneously or is there always 
a psychological problem or impediment or they get grammars mixed up. Well, I happen to have the most beautiful five and a half year old goddaughter who speaks fluent Swedish and fluent English. And in fact, she just got her first report card and she is exceptional in everything. I mean, she is just, she's also gorgeous, of course. <laughs> um, and she is really very smart. And when she talks to me, she talks perfect English. When she turns to her mother, she speaks perfect Swedish. And she is, she's grown up in a, uh, her father is, is an American, her mother is Swedish, her father speaks only um, English to her, and her mother speaks only Swedish, and she is very fluent in uh, both languages. Uh, in Africa, for example, in, there are some villages where, I mean, you have to learn four languages as you're growing up. Uh, I mean, a, a child growing up in, in, your, uh, in uh, um, Nigeria, uh, whose native language, maybe the father speaks uh, Yoruba and the mother speaks Ishikiri, but the, ma the la lingua franca in the area is Hausa. The child probably learns Hausa and English because it's Anglophone Africa and Ishikiri and Yoruba and maybe a little Igbo. Uh, and my, one of my, my own PhD students who is a Berber whose native language was Tamazigh spoke and by, he said by the time he was 10, he was speaking French, Tamazic, Arabic, and then he learned English pretty well. Uh, but that came after he went to, he was, I think he was after he was 12. But the first French, Tamazic, and, and Arabic were fluent and were all learned. Now, people have said that there are problems, and there might be, but I, it's not necessarily the, the language input problem, and probably there are other uh, questions. We do know that you can grow up. Usually, however, it is not equal input that you're getting, and so there might be certain problems in learning the second language, and you might not be a pure bilingual. But I do not think that the original notion that a child will be psychologically damaged or have language learning difficulties in a multilingual situation has ever been shown to be the case. All right, here and then whoever, I can't see, yes. All right, this one, then this one. I will ask. The question, there are three questions, really. The first one is, do I have any idea how the relationship or the rules which relate form and meaning are related in the brain? Two, can I, can, uh, you want an example of how this is done, how meaning is, depends on form. Uh, and third, will I give you an answer to the police were ordered to stop drinking after midnight? Well, why don't I start with the last part, but I'm not going to give you the whole answer. I mean, clearly we know that it was either the police who had to stop drinking after midnight or the police had to stop somebody else from drinking. Now, those are the two obvious ones. Now, the rest of them you can go back and think about. Uh, however... <laughs> On the first, yes, I do have some ideas about how, uh, well, let me say, how, what, how the mental representation of the grammar, because it's not just form and meaning, it's the whole part of the grammar. In fact, if you would like to come on Wednesday, I gather I'm speaking on the nature and the structure of the mental lexicon, and I do deal with also a certain other aspects. It's, that's a very long, hard question to answer at this point. Let me just say, do I... When you talk about form and, and meaning, or structure and meaning, there are a number of ways to look at it. First of all, we know that the very the, a word is, has a certain form, and it is arbitrarily related to its meaning. How a child puts those two together is a problem which has plagued philosophers for at least 2,000 years. And it's, it's, it seems simple, but it's, I mean, sometimes it's simple. If you point to a table and you say, table, 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 you look at a house and you say, house. 
or you say casa, or you say uh, 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 odong, which is the word in chui, or you say uh, you know um, dong, and, and, and it's all very arbitrary as to to the form and meaning. But that, even though that's not simple, that's simpler than trying to see now how do we begin to get and acquire the rules by which, for example, we can. Um, well, you take a, a simple sentence, uh, another ambiguous sentence. Um, uh, old, uh, old men and women are delightful to be with. Okay, That can, of course, mean either old men and all women are delightful to be with, right? Or it can mean old men and old women are delightful to be with. Um, now, that the way we know that is I could show you a, a, a little tree, diagram tree, to show you that underlying those two meanings, there are two structures. And actually, it must be that when we parse that sentence, when we comprehend that sentence, we actually construct, and I'm talking about a very abstract, I mean, we don't actually take a pencil up here and construct it, but we actually have a mental abstract um, uh, tree, if you will, or, or diagram, which represents those two meanings. Um, these are the kinds of things we we teach and we you know in linguistics and it's uh, I think I answered all of them didn't I right <laughs> yes. What, I mean, what kind of evidence? I'm not quite sure. The question is, if language is innate, there should be some genetic. I think there is. I mean, we have anatomical differences in the brain, for example. Uh, and we also have evident, the kind of evidence I've been giving you. I mean, it's, you know, you can't always have evidence of data that you can taste and touch. I mean, we still haven't seen an atom, you know, but, but we, but we uh, divide them and we make atom bombs. Um, and so that the kind, I mean, I think there is a lot of ev otherwise, well, let me just say this. I don't understand how a two-year-old child can say and understand what she does if there, she was not predisposed genetically to construct certain kind of rules and learn certain kind of language. I mean, it's totally beyond me. When you listen to children sometimes, it's unbelievable. They can't do anything else. They can't tie their shoes. And they, you know, and they say, you know, are we going to go to the circus next week and have an ice cream cone? I mean, that's a very hard sentence. I mean, that kind of evidence, plus there is the biological evidence in terms of brain structure. Ah, the question is, what about people who have strokes who, uh, and revert back to their original language? You mean who, bilingual people or pe Well, first of all, that is a, it's a f marvelous question, and there is so much contradictory evidence. And one of the things we don't know, you have to know, if someone has a stroke and starts uh, has lost the language that they're using. Let's say if I knew, uh, actually, my first language was uh, Osa, and I, I don't speak English, and I'd start speaking in, you know, I have 18 clicks, um, which it does. I have eight marvelous clicks. Uh, and how the question is, what, how strong was that? How much was it used? Was that the last line? Was it ever used before? Uh, or how much was it, was it used more? Was it known more? I mean, there, the differences, there are lots and lots of, of cases that are very different in that regard. And frankly, we do not know. There's a, a book out called The Bilingual Brain, uh, which deals with various kinds of evidence. It's a book that is, is um, uh, edited by Lorraine Obler. Uh, and there's a lot of contradictory evidence. There are some interesting hypotheses, but we really do not understand. Uh, e we don't even know 
whether we have two grammars if you're bilingual, or whether we have one combined one, or probably some people have one and other people have two, and some people have three, and sometimes they're, I mean, we don't know. It depends very much on when the language was learned, how it's used, et cetera. Dr. Falcon, it's, it's 10 o'clock. I think we really must. <laughs> oh, well, here's, here's one, a, more one more question. One more. One more, okay. Fine. Of course. The question is, uh, really, I'm sure it comes about because in trying to deal, oh, the question says a child, se languages have different sentence structures. And a child, even if there are universals that are part of the universal grammar, and a child is innately indis you know, d uh, disposed, not indisposed, that's an interesting feature. Uh, a child is disposed to learn a uh, language, still they ha the child has to get input. Absolutely. It's why deaf children don't learn spoken language. They, they can't hear. Uh, what we're suggesting is that there are universal principles, not the specifics of a particular language. It's almost like you have a variable, or now the sort of the, the jargonistic uh, terminology in, in at least one linguistic theory. We talk about parametric uh, 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 or uh, parameters. So a child knows that the normal or the unmarked case in a language, in order to form a negative, you put the, the negative particle before the verb. But suppose it's a language which instead puts it after the verb. The child has to get that input and has to set that parameter, if you will. And obviously, otherwise, we grow up talk, you know, speaking tree, but we don't. We speak English. I'm sure some of you speak more languages than that. But you have to have the input, and that provides the input for the child, in a sense, to trigger that universal grammar so the child knows what to look for, knows what, you know, how to choose one structure as opposed to another, and actually to be able to construct that language grammar, which at the basis of which are certain universal principles, but certainly has to get it from the adult community. Yeah, I have to quit. Oh, very good. <laughs>